In this episode of Tech Talk, I have a Yamaha KX300U. This is a single deck, non-auto reverse cassette deck that features Dolby B, Dolby C, and the Dolby HX headroom extension. This one was brought in from a client for repair and uh, we don't know what's wrong with it, so uh, let's take a look. Got it hooked up to my amplifier and I've got it hooked up to my sound source, my, with my little mp3 player with my royalty free content on there but we'll see first of all whether this thing plays for starters which it does whoa that thing sounds slow first thing we'll notice is that the left channel is low and if we listen to the left channel here it sounds pretty pretty muffled so we'll stop this. And First of all, we'll check the head to see whether the head is, is dirty. Because that could certainly cause bad sound. I don't know, guys. What do you think? That looks like a big chunk of dirt on the head right here. You can see it. I'll scrape it off with my fingernail. That may be why the sound is sounding a little muddy on one channel. On a cassette tape, the left channel is close to the center and the right channel is along the edge. As you can see, that uh, head looks pretty, pretty filthy. Let's get in here and clean this up and see what comes off this head. roller and the capsule went pretty, pretty dirty too. I'll we'll just clean them off. Auto stop is on the uh, supply side so I just have to flip the supply reel to keep it from stopping. So I can get this clean. Yeah, it's just a little bit of grime on the head and on the pinch roller and the caption shaft on this unit. Just a little bit of dirt. Let's see how this sounds now. Have we improved the sound in any way? Let's uh, check out the speed. So of course this is where the, the digital scope comes in handy and if you think you're seeing some RF on there, well actually you are. I'll show you. This is my, uh, I have my little 1440 kilohertz AM stereo transmitter turned on right now and uh, in my workshop here even though it's it's 400 milliwatt signal which which it's, it's enough power to make it to about the end of the block on the AM band. I mean, it's pretty pathetic, but I'll show you what happens here. The It's just being picked up by, I'm connected to the speaker leads off the amplifier. I'm going to play the tape deck through the amplifier and just pick it up off the speaker leads. And the speaker lead is acting as an antenna and it's picking up that signal. So about 752 millivolts. If I turn it off, you'll see what happens. Okay, so that's all that noise is. You see that? Just my scope is being influenced by a broadcast transmitter. So I think this sounds a little slow. This is a 440 hertz tone. And when I heard the music there, it sounded a little bit slow. 
and we are. We're 434 hertz. This should be 440. So a little bit flat. So I'm going to uh, adjust the speed on this. Got a light that keeps going on and off behind me. If you see it, all of a sudden the light level changes. It's because I've got a, my light, my floodlight behind me is going on and off. It's a uh, 40 watt or 42 watt CFL bulb, but it also has been in service since 2002. I've got two original bulbs. One is the one I've shown before where it's held together by a zip tie. Um, I think this one here probably suffering the same fate. If I tap it, there it goes out, you see? It comes back on. I have a feeling I have to take this one apart and resolder a connection on the uh, on the ballast but it's an old bulb that just keeps going I've got two such CFLs here in the workshop 42 watt they were I think they were commercial electric commercial electric is what they are and it's funny because I bought three bulbs when I when I built the house in 2002 I bought three of them for the workshop. That was before I put the linear fluorescence in here. I thought that uh, I, th I, th I thought for a while there that CFLs would be would give me more than sufficient light. So when I built the place, they put they put five just regular porcelain, actually plastic ceiling light bulb fixtures, <coughs> five boxes in here, <coughs> and I put three. 42 watt one directly over the bench one in the middle of the workshop and one a little bit to my left Over that way one behind me one above me and on up to that side and then the other two I think I just put regular uh, 20 watt or so bulbs in there um, One of them blew up within the first month it died so I contacted the manufacturer and they sent me two replacements, which I haven't even opened them yet. They're still in the box. They're, and they were TCP lamps. The other two are still going strong. One of them is right behind me here. That's started to, just starting to go on and off a bit. And the other one, well, the heat from the, uh, the, the, the tube itself cracked all the plastic. And the UV light from it cracked all the plastic. So it's held together with a zip tie. But hey, it still works. I'm, I'm waiting to see how long this thing will actually go for, but it's uh, what? It's uh, 2018 now, so uh, 15 years. These CFLs have been going for 15 years. Anyway, so for those that say that CFLs don't last, I beg to differ. Some of them do. Some of them die. If they get turned on and off all the time, they don't seem to last, but some of them last quite a while. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's find the speed adjustment on this thing. So here's looking down from the top. This is our real motor. This one's our capstan motor. And this one here is, I think it's, it's just a two wire. So the speed control is actually on the motor itself. There's going to be a little grommet in the back here. And this is where you adjust the speed. So I'm just gonna grab a small screwdriver that I can adjust that with. One of these little jewelers type screwdrivers works. And I'm going to turn it on and we'll just adjust the speed right through here to get it to the right pitch. So here we go, play. Close enough. We take into consideration the minute changes due to wow and flutter. That's pretty darn close. Okay. 
that is, uh, I think, as close as this deck is going to get. I'm going to call that on speed. You have to remember with these belt drive uh, units, which this is, there's always going to be a little bit of variance. It's never going to be exact. And the reason for that is the flywheel effect. The some decks had bigger flywheels and some of the older ones actually had huge heavy flywheels. I have an old Sony that I, I've, I've worked on before and it's mine. I should do another service on it. Um, it's a big old top loader that I've hung on to because they're, they're a really nice old deck. And the, the flywheel on that thing, I don't know, it weighs probably five pounds. You know, three to five pounds for the flywheel. It's, it's solid. And I mean this one here, I don't know whether this one's a metal one. I can't see it from here or not. It probably is a metal flywheel. Some of them use plastic, which was junk, but uh, even at that, the flywheels on these ones aren't very heavy. So you will get some slight drift in the speed, but it's it's pretty darn close. I mean, that's why they went to uh, direct drive. And my, my Technics RSM275, for example, it's a servo, quartz lock servo uh, controlled direct drive capstan motor. And the, the, the actual flywheel is quite heavy on that one too. Not as heavy as the old Sony, but it's a good sized flywheel. Here we can see that the belt for the tape counter has just melted and that's because this is a real pure rubber belt so one like this uh, you, you wouldn't be able to oh, why did I do that? Now I got crap on my hands. Uh, you wouldn't be able to uh, boil a belt like that because it's just basically turned to goo. So um, Let's see if I can find something to replace that with so we can get the tape counter working because this is one that's uh, in for service. So I'm going to see if I can find a belt. I'm going to have to clean up though. There's going to be some remnants from the old one. I'm going to have to actually get in there with a Q-tip and some isopropyl alcohol and try and clean that goo out because if I don't, then what's going to happen is that goo is going to contaminate another belt and a new belt is going to disappear very quickly into a, a, a sticky mess. So we're going to just get in here with the Q-tip and see if I can get this crap out of here. So we're going to have to take out the, the front of the, the uh, cassette holder here. Because I need to be able to get to the pulley in behind it and clean that off so that I can get a new belt in here for the... the uh, holds this in there's a screw on one side it looks like it's a looks like it's just a clip on the other side let's see if I can pop this out here and it should come out like that which it just did and now this should lift out almost I should come out now This should lift out. So that I can get to the, the uh, tape hub in behind and replace the belt. So we just have to kind of work at this a bit. It'll lift out. I just have to clear all of the, uh, the tape switches and sensors and stuff that's in here for detecting the type of tape. And it'll lift out. It should anyway. Not that I need to really go much further than that because I can access the gear here to clean the crud off of this one from the remains of that belt. See, this is what happens when these belts melt is they just create a real mess from behind. And uh, for anybody working on them after, this gets on your hands and you can't get rid of it. It's just, it's brutal. And it'll get on anything that you touch and leave a black sticky mess behind. I hate it when this happens. And it happens quite a bit on old tape decks that have been sitting around for years without being used. 
if this had been continued to be used, this wouldn't have happened. I gotta get this thing back in place. Like that. Okay. Now I should be able to put the uh, screw back in here and the clip. Whatever I did with that. Here's the screw. I guess it's the screw. And that side is in place now, but the tough part is going to be getting the other clip in because Yamaha and their wisdom use these goddamn rivets. And of course, once they're spread out, it's really tough to get them back in the hole to put it back in place. I hate these things. You know, it's uh, you pretty much have to replace them because once they've been once they've been put in service, they uh, are really hard to get back in. When they're new, they're easy to put them in place. But when they've been when they've been removed, sometimes they just don't go back in as easy as they came out. If you know what I mean, and certainly not as easy as they went in the first time. But I might be able to do this. Oh, you know, I got it. I believe it. And the keeper behind it here to hold it in place. My George, I think I've got it. Let's uh, take a listen to this thing now and then we'll do a recording on it. So, here's my... Te oh. Test tape. Power. So I'm going to uh, roll this tape forward a bit and then we'll do a test recording. Okay, we're going to make our test recording here. I'm going to play track number 84. This is actually a, a track from, um, this is triple scoop music. This is not Music Bakery. This is another uh, royalty free uh, content that I have. So let's just track 84. Let this one play. So now we'll rewind and listen to that one again, see how it sounds. That actually sounds very good. Um, excellent sound off this thing. 
just want to show you guys what happens if you record something in Dolby C and you don't use Dolby C for playback, it's not going to sound proper. So let's just play it back and I'll change the Dolby so you can hear the difference. So remember that sounds, with Dolby C it sounds very good, there's very little noise because Dolby C is really quite efficient at removing noise. If I turn it off though, listen how it's going to sound. Now I'll switch it on and off so you can hear the difference. See? Dolby B doesn't sound right either. This is where it turned off. Listen to the noise, or listen to the, the way it changes the sound. There's Dolby B on. So when you record a tape with Dolby C, you pretty much have to use it to, to get the proper sound on playback. Dolby B, you can get away. If you record something in Dolby B and you play it on a deck without uh, using any Dolby B reduction for playback, your high frequencies are a little more uh, emphasized, but it still sounds relatively normal. Uh, Dolby C, though, does, as you can hear, does make a completely different change to the sound. Um, I'll have to do another demo at some point. I'll grab my DBX deck and we'll play around with DBX and do a different do a comparison between how DBX does because you can still listen to Dolby C with without uh, a Dolby C encoded tape without Dolby C on. Yeah, you can do it. It doesn't sound proper, but you can listen to it with the DBX encoded tape though. Uh, I'll play some DBX encoded tapes on a non DBX deck and we'll see whether you can actually tolerate it because. It sounds pretty bad. Um, what DBX does is it's even more extreme than Dolby C. It works across the entire frequency spectrum and it basically takes everything below a certain level and it cranks it way up. And it takes everything above a certain level and it squishes it down. So it's called a compander. So it, it compresses all the loud passages down to half of its level and it boosts the quiet passages up to twice its level. So You've got about an 80 dB signal to noise or 70 dB signal to noise ratio that is compressed into about a 30 dB uh, or 40 dB wide uh, uh, dynamic range that's recorded onto tape. And then on playback, it expands it. And uh, it does a good job when it's set up properly, but uh, DBX has its own demons. You can get a warbling sound, and it just sometimes it almost sounds robotic if it's not, uh, if it's not calibrated properly. Um, but uh, you don't get any tape hiss. It's you know there's no noise whatsoever on it if it's working properly. Uh, not a lot of companies though uh, incorporated DBX into their tape decks. TAC was one, and uh, Techniques Panasonic was another. They were big on the DBX, but a lot of other companies just ignored it because they had to license it from DBX Laboratories and our DBX Incorporated. It was Dolby Laboratories and DBX Incorporated. This deck also has uh, HX uh, Pro noise uh, or headroom expansion so that's one of the reasons that this tape deck actually sounds as good as it does and th this is a, not a bad tape deck it's, it looks kind of cheap inside because a lot of plastic in here but uh, sonically wise for a two head deck this actually does sound pretty good anyway thanks for watching uh, the service on this unit now I gotta go get my hands all cleaned up because I you know okay <laughs> we'll catch you in the next one real soon bye for now